This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, where I'm talking to Susan Young, author of the book Growing Beans. As I've looked further into a sustainable diet, into growing and storing crops, and also because I've been incorporating some weight training into my exercise routine, I've been looking at sources of protein, and beans just seem to tick every box, but I needed to know more. So Susan's book is exactly what I've been looking for, because it covers growing, harvesting and storing beans, and it argues a very convincing case for a fact that many people the world over have known for centuries, that beans are good not only for you, but for the planet, because they're such a resilient, easy to grow, low carbon footprint crop. Susan begins by explaining why beans are such a super crop. Well, I mean, the the first key point is that beans have this ability to fix nitrogen. And that's a fairly well known fact. But what I think isn't appreciated is quite how that process works. So they are able via a bacteria, rhizobia, to uh, fix nitrogen that's in the air and convert that into amino acids that then becomes the amino acid, the protein in the beans that we then eat. But what's, I think, often not appreciated is, is that it's not so much that the beans are leaving nitrogen behind in the soil. That's often what people think, that you should grow a green crop after beans because they're leaving nitrogen in the soil. That actually, if you're harvesting the beans and eating the beans as plump, fully formed beans, as it were, then then the plants pushed all the amino acids into the beans and there's not a lot left behind in the roots. But what they are able to do, therefore, is to grow in soil which is low in nitrogen to start off with. So they're very good to follow a a crop that needs nitrogen. So they're good to follow greens and they don't need a lot of extra fertilizer or um, compost. So they're very light on the soil in that respect. And they also need uh, less water than many crops. So that's one of the reasons why they're a very good crop to grow in terms of soil enrichment. The other thing, of course, is the whole argument about the way that we exploit the land to produce meat and therefore protein that we obtain from meat uh, requires a vast quantity of land to to, to produce that that one pound of meat in comparison, or one pound of protein, I should say, in comparison with the um, amount of uh, land that's required to grow beans. So that they're so economical in terms of how much land they need to produce the same amount of protein. And obviously, then there's the whole argument about the carbon emissions. So the carbon emissions from beans is minuscule, I mean, almost nothing, whereas carbon emissions from producing uh, meat-based protein is is considerably higher. Don't ask me to quote the exact figures. They're in the book, but I can't remember them precisely. And anyway, I think lots and lots of estimates vary. So it's enough, I think, to say that the amount of carbon emissions from meat is it's considerably higher than the carbon emissions from beans. I have to say, the case you set out at the beginning in the book is so convincing. Why are we not growing more beans? It it, it just doesn't make it, you know it just doesn't make sense not to for, for for all those reasons and for preserving biodiversity and all the other health related reasons that go hand in hand with with the climate change arguments. And in the year that we've had um, the, the climate change conference and heard all those arguments about the need to reduce carbon emissions, it's just so, so important. From my personal point of view, I do find the whole thing a little bit confusing in terms of varieties and different species. And I did wonder if maybe beans are a little bit misunderstood, um, whether there's a lack of information around them or knowledge. And I thought it'd be quite useful to just cover briefly what type of beans we usually grow in the UK. Yes. Well, so So most people are familiar with broad beans, and I don't actually talk about broad beans in the book. The book is about um, the the family of beans, the Fasciolus vulgaris, which is a common bean, and Fasciolus cochineus, which is the runner bean. So most people are familiar with runner beans, and they're familiar with French beans. They're familiar with broad beans. Now, we 
eat broad beans at the shelling stage. We don't eat them to dry. We have a, a tradition in this country of eating French beans and runner beans at the green stage, which is where just to eat the pods or mange too, or um, the, 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 the sort of green fine stage. We don't have a tradition of allowing the beans inside to swell and then even to eat them at that swell at, when they're sort of at a stage called demi-sec, when they're just starting to dry, but they're very nice to pick fresh and eat as you would eat peas. Um, and then we also don't have much of a tradition of allowing them to dry or picking them and, and then drying them to store for later. And of course, most of the, because we've had a tradition of of eating beans at the green stage and a liking for runner beans to eat as long, green, thin runner beans. We don't, the, the varieties aren't available for beans that are going to be very good to eat as, as in the shelling, at the shelling stage or to dry to eat later. Um, and it's difficult. Most of the seed catalogues will only sell, provide French beans to eat as the green, the green stage, and similarly with runner beans. Um, and in some seed catalogues in Europe, they make qu a quite clear distinction between French beans that are to eat green and beans to eat to dry, à écossais, they say in French, to, to, to be dried. So there's a quite clear distinction between those two types of beans, as with runner beans, uh, but we don't do that in English seed catalogues because we haven't had a tradition of it. So, so really, but, and there are some beans very uh, com conveniently that you can eat at the green stage or you can eat at the demi-sec or you can eat them fresh or then at this, this very particular stage of demi-sec when they're just going dry, um, just starting to turn, that's a particular, they're particularly nice at that stage, or you can pick them and dry them and cook them from, soak them obviously and, and cook them from dry later. Um, and the most of the beans that I grow belong to the Fasciolus vulgaris family, so they're common beans, of which there are just thousands upon thousands of varieties. Um, and then some of the beans are the Fasciolus cochineus variety, which is the runner bean family. And interestingly, in parts of Europe, they've developed, they've grown varieties of Fasciolus cochineus to be, to produce large beans, mostly white beans in Eastern Europe. And those are the lovely Greek gigantes or gigantes beans, and also the Polish beans, big white beans, which are absolutely delicious. And the pods are short and stubby, quite unlike in a way, the normal French, uh, sorry, runner bean pods that we would um, think of. So if I had some green beans that I bought for eating at the green stage, or indeed runner beans, would it matter if I then let them grow on and harvested them as beans? It wouldn't matter, but they're, they're not necessarily going to be very good at, it would depend completely on the variety. So they're not necessarily going to be very good to, to allow them to grow on to the, to the seed stage, as it were, to allow them to plump up. Because for one thing, most of the modern varieties of French beans have been bred to, obviously, to be stringless green pods. And the beans form quite late. And the beans form that form are, are as fine as they can possibly be. So they haven't been bred to produce large beans. Um, so, so they might be all right. There are quite a few varieties which can serve dual purpose, but it's better to buy and to sow and to grow varieties that are, have, uh, are intended to be eaten at the shelling or the drying stage. And the same with... Um, the same with runner beans. You can grow runner beans on to be large and allow them to plump up and then eat them as at the bean stage, as it were. But you're going to get the, those really large, big, meaty beans if you grow the ones that have been intended to be grown as to be eaten as as beans. So, are there any that are unsuitable or even toxic that you wouldn't eat at the seed or bean stage? Well, all beans, I mean, as a general rule of thumb, all, all beans need to be boiled up. I mean, all, bean, all beans contain, a, a, shouldn't be eaten raw. They contain 
um, a toxin that is, that is um, I don't know quite what the process is to, uh, uh, to explain it, but I know that the toxin is, I don't think it's removed, but it, it, it's no longer toxic if you've boiled the beans. Um, and that's certainly true of kidney beans and then cannellini beans, which are quite closely related to kidney beans. So I happen to not grow kidney beans because I don't like them very much. Um, but I know that you do need to boil kidney beans, take particular care with kidney beans to be sure to boil them for a good 10 minutes, if not more. But as a rule of thumb, I always boil, give beans a rolling boil for about 10 minutes just to be on the safe side. Um, particularly if I'm cooking them from um, from dry, from the dry stage. Uh, but otherwise, no. I mean, I don't. I can't think of any of any other beans that wouldn't be safe to grow if you're diverting from the um, from the seed from the normal seed catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going off piste with it, I know. I mean, and I've bought some really. I mean, I buy beans in in markets, you know. Where whenever, I mean, when I wasn't quite so concerned about our uh, um, carbon footprint, I travelled. Fortunate enough to be able to travel to lots of different places, and I've always made a beeline for the markets and bought beans to bring back and see what I can grow. Um, and I've eaten those beans, and I'm still here to tell the tale. So I don't think I've been poisoned yeah. by them. I mean. You have to prepare them properly because if you're not used to eating beans, of course, they can be, they can cause you discomfort if you, if you're not used to digesting them. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't take very long to kind of acclimatize your, your digestive system to being able to digest beans. Um, cause they, they, they're digested in the, in the lower intestine through a different, through a bacterial process. And, and you just need to, your body just needs to accumulate those bacteria in your lower intestine in order to, to digest beans. But of course, that's what makes them particularly good for you health-wise. I'm assuming that if you wanted to harvest beans at that stage, you also need to either dry them on the plant or find a way of drying them once they're off. And it's interesting in your book, actually, because you mentioned that sometimes in the UK climate, it's difficult to get beans to dry to the point where they're dry enough to store. And I think I must be really lucky because I'm down on the south, south coast and I've actually, because I'm a lazy gardener, left a lot of beans to go to seed and I've actually managed to dry the pods on the plant and then harvest them, put them in a jar and they've been absolutely fine, fingers crossed. But I think maybe in other parts of the UK, it's not so straightforward. No, and th this is the, the, the challenge with beans in that you've, you know, they need a long growing period, particularly if you're going to grow um, climbing beans which maybe will flower later and then produce their, their pods later. The advantage, of course, with climbing beans is that you get a bigger crop for the, for the amount of space they take up in comparison with dwarf beans. But if you want to be sure of the beans plumping up in the pod and then starting to dry, it's best to grow dwarf beans, but you're not going to get quite the same crop for the amount of space that you're using. Um, but that's the... The, the challenge for growing beans in the UK is, is to get the growing season in before the, the, the weather closes in in the autumn. So that's why you have to start them off early and start them off in, inside and then keep an eye on them when they're coming round to the cropping stage. Um, and it's also, of course, depends a lot on the variety. So there are plenty of varieties from northern Europe which do perfectly well in our climate and will, will come to the... Um, will start to dry on the, on the on the vine or dry on the plant um, but I'm also interested in trying to in trying to grow beans from Spain and Italy and southern France and and they as a general rule seem to take seem to, to need a longer season uh, but what I mostly do is just keep an eye on the plants and it, it's just a question of keeping an eye on them picking what is starting to go dry if you want to dry them and then bringing them in either just putting them in baskets in the greenhouse where you think they're going to dry off or bringing them indoors depending on 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 the time of the year and depending on the season i mean if they and if they get very wet and soggy maybe you need to just dry them off on on a warm boiler or radiator or something just to make sure they don't go soggy mm -hmm. so there's a it takes a little bit of care to be able to 
harvest the beans if you want to dry them. Um, and it, you just need to be looking regularly and picking a few all the time. That's what I tend to do, putting them in baskets. On the other hand, you know, dwarf beans, you can often, as you say, get them to, I don't know if it was dwarf beans or climbing beans that you managed to get to dry on the plant. Climbing beans and climbing beans. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they will do. I mean, I'm fairly far south too, but I'm, I'm further west in terms of rain. So my, my problem, my issue is always that the rains come in in the autumn and, and then, but it's, but it's air around the plants that, that's more problematic than, than the rain. So if you can keep the air circulating around the plants, it doesn't matter if it rains and they start to get wet into the autumn. It's, uh, so it's about keeping them clean. It could be worth picking the leaves off in order to allow the air to circulate around the pods. And I have had beans, I'm looking out of the window now because I'm looking at a, a, a bean frame that I know I have wh- where it, um, it, it frequently falls out, well, sort of leans dangerously to one side when it gets heavy with beans. It always does it. And then the beans hang free and, and they're in the, they've got the air circulating and they can be there until November even that I'm still picking them. So it just depends on the weather. It depends what kind of autumn we have. It depends on the variety. It depends how early you started them and, and it depends on lots of things. Um, and it just takes a little bit of experience to get used to the knowing when to, to harvest them. Yeah, I think we still had some on there in November into December, just hanging there, brown pods full of beans, which was, you know, a miracle really that no animals decided to eat them. Yes, well, it, that's another that's another issue. I mean, I have a lot of field mice because we have um, a field. We're surrounded by fields, um, and the field mice love the beans and will just come along and nibble them and um, make little stashes of them. They 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 open the pods and take the beans away and make little stores for themselves, which is very nice for the mice, I'm sure, but not nice for me. Talking about the winter, I could have kicked myself because I've just got around to clearing some of my veg beds and I dug up a huge tuba of a runner bean and I said to my colleague, look at that, I wonder if we could save that. And then in your book, I see that you can. Yes, and we were in Guernsey um, late summer, September, we went for a week to Guernsey and there's a Victorian garden in Guernsey. And I noticed that they'd, or they'd cut their um, runner beans down and just left them as as little stalks for that very purpose to overwinter them. So, so yes, so fussy. So the um, runner bean family are, are perennial, and they produce quite a fat tuber, and you can overwinter them. And I've done it a few times now. The other the other reason I do it is because they will cross pollinate more than. The vulgaris variety, cochineas will cross pollinate. So if I keep the plants, obviously, then I'm uh, I don't have to worry about sowing seed, saving seed, and sowing it when when it may have cross pollinated. And I tend to grow to keep the Greek ones because those are the ones I love and grow every year. And I also keep the Polish ones, the Polish white beans, uh, handsome Johnny or. There is a Polish name, but I'm not going to try and pronounce it for you. Um, but the Polish beans are a little bit smaller, but they're a little bit more prolific, I find, than the Greek ones. So they're worth growing because they're, they're quite generous. Uh, so both those varieties I tend to overwinter. And you don't need to keep, I don't keep very many. I keep about half a dozen of each and just store them under the, but just the same as you would with dahlia tubers, exactly the same. They're a bit sluggish to, uh, I, I don't know, I keep them in the greenhouse. They're a bit sluggish to start in the spring. You know how you look at them and you think, are these really going to do something? And you've watered them and potted them up. But then they do, actually, and they produce quite a few vines. So they come each year they'll come bigger, which is the other advantage of doing it. So it's, I, I think it's well worth doing it, but um, it depends how many bean plants you want to grow and how much greenhouse space you've got. I'm definitely going to try it, if nothing else, because of the fact that I can. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that's, <laughs> that's me too. I, just, I tried it a couple of years and it seemed... Seems so easy, um, uh, so easy to do it. Work to treat. So I, I do it now. I've got two, two, just two normal sized wooden boxes, like apple crates, with them all packed in. Um, one is the Greek beans, and the other is the Polish beans, and they'll come round again. I mean, I was inspired after reading your book to order some unusual varieties, and I did go for the Greek 
Gigantes, and I went for lots of ones that were very pretty. One I'm especially excited about is District Nurse. Yes. Oh, yes. That's a very good one to go. I, I like that one. It's it, and it's it's very robust. It it'll and it'll crop early, and has the most beautiful coloured pods. They're really unusual. They're kind of um, pale green, streaked with a sort of navy, almost quite striking. I was also inspired by your pictures where you grow your beans with flowers that kind of match them. I do like a pretty veg garden. If somebody was starting out and experimenting with growing beans, what would be some of the easiest ones that you might recommend? I'm not sure. I mean, they're all pretty easy, to be honest. I'm slightly struggling to think of what would be the easiest one to grow. They're all, they're all very obliging. I mean, beans are really very easy. And I, I guess I'm a slightly, um, I'm not a, a lazy gardener, but I'm kind of slightly, slightly casual. I would say. So I don't like crops that need a lot of fussing over. So I've, that's why I've been drawn to grow beans as well, because they're just so easy. But I think that I would always, I mean, you can't go wrong with the borlotti, and I know lots of people are growing borlottis, although they can be a bit slow to crop and they don't crop that heavily. Um, the district nurse that, that you, you're growing is a very good one. I'd always go for the, the Greek beans because the beans the Greek gigantes, gigantes, because the, the white beans are so versatile. There are some wonderful German ones. Uh, one I'm particularly fond of is called Schneekipchen in German, but it, that means snow cap. And it's quite a big bean and it's half kind of toffee coloured and half cream coloured. It's got like a little dollop of cream on top, like snow on a mountain. That's why it's called Schneekipchen. And it's um, it doesn't grow too tall so it crops so it flowers early and then it crops early so some of the german ones um because they're growing them in the mountains in austria and southern germany um are particularly robust and they don't grow too tall and they, that means they then flower early and they they crop early so you can be sure of quite a a heavy quite a good crop from them and that's um a, a very good bean there's one from croatia which is my current favourite. I tend to have favourites at different times. So my current favourite is one from Croatia called uh, Domaci Kuczak. Or do, that's how I would pronounce it, Domaci Kuczak. And I don't know how you would get that bean, though, um, having recommended it. This, the, the dwarf beans, I mean, the other thing is that there are a lot of Dutch beans, um, which are mostly dwarf beans, and they come from... The, the north of Holland, Friesland, um, and there's been quite a movement in, in the Netherlands to rediscover the heritage beans and to grow them in um, you know, gar special gardens where they're cultivating these heritage crops. And there are a lot of interesting, quite small Dutch beans on dwarf plants, and they also would be very useful to grow. Um, and because they're grown in North Holland, obviously they're, they're used to a, a, a cold, wet climate. Uh, the other one, the other one that's very good to grow um, is that French one called Coco, Coco de Pampol or Pampol or something. Again, the pronunciation, it, you spell it P-A-I-M-P-O-L. And that come, that's grown traditionally in Brittany. And it, that's also a dwarf bean, and it's quite a, a it's a round white one um, that you pick at the demisex stage. So it's traditionally picked at the demisex stage. And then, of course, there would be the tarbe bean, which is the traditional cassoulet bean from southwest France. And herbs and I happen to know that you can get that from herbs and herb the herbery beans and herbs. Or is it herbs and beans? I, I might, they might, the name might be the other way. I'm from and I can't think what it, which way around it goes. Yes, I know. Well, they she has the most wonderful selection of beans and um, the tarbe bean that she um, supplies, uh, I've always found that does very well. And that's a, a kind of medium sized, um, sort of slightly cashew shaped white bean. And the French beans are mostly white. The, the French didn't like, and traditionally they've, grown a lot of white beans because they they didn't like the look of black beans in in dishes because they use a lot of cream and milk and they the, the black would kind of seep into the milk and they disliked the color 
So, um, so you find that a lot of the French beans are white, whereas the Spanish ones are wonderful, rich colours. And I mean, the, you, the other interesting thing is that there are, I've got some old gardening books from the 19, you know, 1950s and 60s. I'm looking down at some of them. And um, you find, so the, you'll find the Dutch beans, the North Holland brown and Mexican black. You find those beans in these gardening books up to the 1950s and 60s. And there's one here called Ve- Vegetables for the Epicure, and it's the, the, those kinds of beans are in that, that book. And somehow we, they, they just said they were being grown up until the, and they're certainly grown during the war as part of the Dick Victory campaign, included growing beans. And these Dutch beans and the, the Mexican blacks are being grown during the war. And somehow, you know, they've just gone out of favour, I think. I think we just lost the tradition of, of growing them. And we don't have a strong tradition in this country of cooking beans. We don't have a culinary tradition of growing beans of, and cooking them. And so they just, it's not a tradition that's been continued since the war. And what if you had to pick just one to cook with? I think my favourite is an Italian bean called Zolfino, or Zolfini if you want to say the plural. So a Zolfino bean, it's, it's a ra- little round Italian bean that is sort of slightly pale yellow, sulfury colour. And it grows in, on very straggly dwarf bushes. So some dwarf beans produce like a, a long, a sort of three foot leader, which is a throwback to their climbing origins, because all beans originally all were climbing. And these Zolfino beans have a very straggly bushes and tend to produce this long straggly leader. But it's a very nice bean. It's n- not a, very starchy so it stays firm when you cook it and it costs an enormous amount to buy from gourmet food sellers so you can buy it from I think um Frenchy was selling it in their delicatessen range for sort of like 10 pounds a bag and I don't know where you can obtain the seed though I mean I've ended up having to buy a bag of beans from them and then sowing the beans because of course if they're organically grown you can just um sow them and they'll germinate uh, but i don't know where you'd get the beans and i had i bought some from italian seed sellers but of course now we can't order from europe we're very restricted in what we can what we can get which is a real shame and how about your favorite way to eat them well to be perfectly honest the more we cook beans to eat the, the more simply we cook them so we cook them with herbs and garlic and just eat them as they are there are some wonderful wonderful pulse cookery books coming out there are lots of wonderful books with with delicious recipes in them but we've come to like beans more and more simply uh, cooked i suppose if you're asking for a favorite dish though it would have to be in a tomato sauce uh, either the Greek beans in tomato sauce or other beans in tomato sauce. And we, we make a tomato sauce. We puree tomatoes at the end of the summer that we, that we grow and then cook them in a fresh tomato sauce. And they're just wonderful like that, just delicious. I hope you've been inspired to grow and eat more beans. If you have, please send me pictures of your plants and beans this summer because I'm really feeling the love for beans. The seed company that Susan referenced in the interview is Beans and Herbs, and I've included a link to their website in the show notes. Thank you to Susan for talking to me about beans. Thank you to you for listening. And just before I sign off, I recently realised that I have an overzealous spam filter, and I discovered lots of really interesting emails in there, and I'm mortified at the thought that I've missed others. If you have emailed me, I will always reply, even if it takes me a good while. So if you've emailed in the past and thought I've ignored you, I haven't. I'm sorry, and do please reach out to me again. That's it from me. Have a great week. Now Dr Ian Bedford talking about a global menace. Precisely 30 years ago, the vast winter vegetable crops of California became headline news around the globe. Since they'd rapidly succumbed to phenomenal infestations of tobacco whitefly, a sap-sucking insect that was assumed to be just a relatively minor pest within tropical and subtropical countries around the world. However, this one millimetre long, sap-sucking bug was so numerous in California 
that many trillions of them formed dense swirling fogs as they moved amongst the crops. This unprecedented event resulted in a catastrophic yield loss of around half a billion dollars, but also presented a mystery as to why a previously insignificant insect should suddenly have become such an extraordinary crop pest. So entomologists throughout the world, including myself, were asked to investigate. We began by setting up international science networks, which then enabled the Californian whitefly to be studied and compared to tobacco whitefly populations from many other countries. And as the research was collated, it became clear that the Californian whitefly was very different to the others. It produced more eggs, transmitted many plant viruses, and most worryingly, was resistant to insecticides and highly polyphagous. It was in fact a new superbug, a type of the tobacco whitefly that had rapidly evolved to survive the chemicals that were being extensively used within crop protection. As the research continued, diagnostic tests were developed that easily distinguished the superbug from other tobacco whitefly populations and enabled it to be tracked across the world which soon revealed that the superbug had already spread to all continents and that it was linked to the global trade in ornamental plants. Dispersing out from infested importations onto field and horticultural crops. Discovering this was a breakthrough since it enabled the whitefly's migration routes to be intercepted. Then, by using integrated crop protection strategies instead of repetitive chemical treatments, the whitefly's insecticide resistance levels were reduced, and so its control within crops throughout the world became more manageable. Despite this though, the superbug strain of the tobacco whitefly remains a serious plant pest and transmitter of crop viruses within warmer regions of the world, which includes southern Europe. And even here in the UK, it remains high on the national list of notifiable pests, and is one of the reasons why ornamental plants, such as imported poinsettias, continue to be checked at our borders. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.